All right. Um, thank you all for your patience. I'm Sriram Kannan. I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington, Seattle, and uh, founder of uh, blockchain startup Layer Labs. Um, this talk is titled Eigenlayer, the Restaking Collective. The Restaking Collective, restaking is a new term. Um, we'll introduce what it is here. The subtitle says, Permissionless Feature Addition to Ethereum. Let me just set my timer here. OK. First acknowledgments, you know, many collaborators on this project. Um, some of them here. Um, Vyas and Gautam, Shavik, Robert, Bowen, Jeffrey. All right, so I'm going to set this talk from a little bit of a historical context. Um, Bitcoin pioneered decentralized trust. What do we mean by that? You have a decentralized trust layer instead of having a central party intermediating your transactions. There is a consensus protocol which arranges this group of people into participating in the protocol. And on top of it, you have a programmability layer, the Bitcoin script, which allowed for some programmability, but limited. And you can think of this as the first example of a monolithic blockchain. What is a monolithic blockchain? It's a blockchain built for a special purpose. Of course, it's also the first blockchain and pioneered this whole idea. Um, but as things started evolving, people wanted to build different applications. And each application, like Namecoin, which is a domain name system, needed to build its own trust network. So Namecoin, Colorcoin, Metacoin, many, many coins, which were started at that time, all for different use cases, each use case, a new trust network, a new blockchain. OK, so Ethereum, you guys, pioneered modular blockchains. What do I mean by that? You have the Ethereum trust network, a fixed consensus protocol, um, I can make it work if I get a fixed consensus protocol and a programmable layer. And on top of the programmable layer, you can build any decentralized applications. So one way to think about this is Ethereum enabled the decoupling of trust and innovation which is on top of the smart contract layer, you can build any decentralized application. You do not need to bring your own trust network for it. Ethereum provides a common trust network on which many people can innovate. This has unleashed an era of open innovation where anybody can create dApps without having to be trusted themselves because they're borrowing trust from Ethereum. What Ethereum has done is let, let us separate trust and innovation. So innovation happens at a different layer, and trust is provided in a common layer. And this is why we see uh, anons can build massive DeFi protocols. To build a financial service is one of the most trusted things. But since the anon is not some anonymous person, is not actually required to be trusted, and trust is borrowed from Ethereum, you can actually, uh, they can actually go ahead and build it. But there is a limitation to the extent of open innovation that can be built on Ethereum. Why do I say this? If you go any deeper than smart contracts and dApps, if you want to build if you want to build new consensus protocols, if you want to build new data availability protocols, if you want to build new ordering layers, if you wanted to build new middleware, you still need, let's see. So 
there are barriers to open innovation. And suppose you want to build your own new consensus protocol. What do you do? You have to go ahead and build your own blockchain. And we, we see the emergence of alt L1s, alternative layer 1s, which have different feature sets, different trade-offs, different consensus protocols, different execution machines, and so on. And what this has done is, again, history repeats itself. Just like Bitcoin, just like Bitcoin, um, you could not build a bunch of different applications on top of Bitcoin, and it fractured trust into smaller communities. What we're seeing here is the alternative L1s, just because you could not build these consensus protocols, these ordering layers, these execution engines into Ethereum, is fracturing trust into smaller groups again. All right, so you have alternative L1s. They all have smaller trust sources. Why? Because you cannot change the consensus protocol in Ethereum, fracturing trust into smaller islands. OK, so another trend we're seeing emerge is the emergence of modular blockchains. So you think of Ethereum. You have the Ethereum consensus stack comprised of various layers, data availability, ordering, settlement, execution. And what's happening is we are seeing new blockchains being built just to perform one of these different functions. Why, are, why is this happening? This is happening because there's no degree of freedom in controlling this inside Ethereum. So you can build dApps which use some arbitrary combination of these existing modules or newly built modules in order to create your dApp. But one thing which is left unsaid in this modular vision is where is the trust layer? Who is providing trust for all these different modules? Again, fracturing of trust into small islands in each of these layers. So just to put some numerical example, let's say the Ethereum trust network has $200 billion stake, not unreasonable in the near future. And each of these layers have some amount staked you know, maybe a 50 billion, 50 billion, 10 billion, whatever. Now, what is the cost of corrupting these dApps, which are relying on this entire chain? Trust is the weakest link. If the execution layer is the weakest link, that's the, that's the trust bottleneck. So the entire cost of corrupting these dApps is $10 billion, instead of if you had a monolithic blockchain, $200 billion. OK. So, Modularity fractures trust. Again, another example. Alt L1s, smaller uh, trust networks. Modularity fractures trust. Middlewares also fracture trust. Oracles, bridges. Anything that you need a distributed validation service needs its own trust network. So one way to uh, visualize this, you, you think of Ethereum as the base layer, and it's supplying trust to the dApps, but only in ordering an execution using the Ethereum protocol. And you have middlewares. They supply trust on other dimensions, for example, reading data from the internet or whatever other things, but they need to build their own trust network. Again, this is a bottleneck to open innovation, because if you want to build your own new Oracle, you need to build your own decentralized trust network, which is extremely difficult. OK, so I'm going to phrase this problem economically, since we are at ETH economics. What is the problem? The problem is, whenever you put down capital in any of these different middlewares, because each of these are staked middlewares, you incur a cost of capital. Suppose you're putting down $50 billion at stake in a certain oracle. That means you need to make a 10% annual rate of return. Right? You need to be making revenue of $5 billion in order to sustain a $50 billion of stake in a certain middleware. There is a massive cost of capital in each module, in each middleware that you touch. As far as the dApps are concerned, dApps rely on not only um, Dapps rely not only on uh, Ethereum, but also these middleware, so they suffer lower trust guarantees. Finally, as far as Ethereum is concerned, or the core layer one is concerned, what is happening is instead of Ethereum being the D 
decentralized trust network, it gets fractured and the value also gets split across all these different applications. All right, so now that I've set up the problem, the problem is a fracture of trust across all tel ones across different modules, across different middlewares. Same story as in the history, why we had to go from Bitcoin to Ethereum. Okay, what we're proposing is a solution to this trust fracture problem and how Ethereum can internalize the economics of modularity. It's called Eigenlayer. What is Eigenlayer doing? Eigenlayer is a mechanism by which the Ethereum trust can be redirected, can be redirected into any new modules that are built, that anybody can build. So the core idea of Eigenlayer is restaking. I'll explain what is restaking. You already staked as a staker or validator in the Ethereum proof of stake network. Now you can take that stake and subject yourself to additional slashing conditions and opt in and opt in to provide new services, new distributed validation services, same validator network. And through Eigenlayer, you can provide many, many different validation services. Could be oracles, bridges, data availability, fair ordering, authentication, whatever you can think of. Instead of allowing innovation at the level only of programming a virtual machine, we can allow innovation at the level of programming the distributed system. You can specify what each node, each staker, what particular types of action they need to be taking. It transforms the innovation scale possible inside Ethereum. Okay, so how does it transform the economics of this situation? As far as the middleware are concerned, because you're restaking, you do not take new cost of capital. It is already the $200 billion that's staked in Ethereum and earning whatever annual percentage rate for staking. You do not take additional marginal capital cost. You're also pooling the capital cost across all the different applications. As far as the dApps are concerned, if you're using middleware, which are widely adopted, you can expect all of the ETH stakers opt in. So you will get the core Ethereum trust on many, many different middleware, and therefore the dApps also get core Ethereum trust. Finally, Ethereum itself starts growing in value, not only in the short term that the stakers make additional yield, by opting into these different services. In the long term, the value of Ethereum is the total future revenue that you can derive by staking Ethereum. And that just takes an exponential upside. Okay, so that's the basic idea of Eigenlayer. It is the restaking collective. What is a restaking collective? What do we do? So we look at the stack of Ethereum. You have the trust network consensus protocol virtual machine, and you had dApps, which anybody could build. Eigenlayer is a series of smart contracts on top of Ethereum, which lets the stakers of Ethereum opt in, opt in to provide additional services. So this is called restaking. Particularly how it works you know, uh, all of your experts here in, uh, in the Ethereum proof of state protocol. The way you do it is you go and s you can be your own home validator for Ethereum, which is one of the big visions of Ethereum. But what you do is you go and when you deposit stake into the ETH st staking contracts, you set the withdrawal credential to this smart contract instead of setting it to your own personal public key. You set it to the eigenlayer withdrawal contracts. So your withdrawal credentials are given to Eigenlayer. Why is it given to Eigenlayer? Because in this series of smart contracts, you opt in to provide additional services. And if you did something wrong in these additional services, you may not be able to withdraw the entirety of your stake. You may get slashed partially. 
So that's it. It does not rely on staking derivatives. It does not lead to any centralization, none of those things. Restaking is a mechanism by which existing stakers opt in to provide additional services for additional yield while taking additional risk. It's a risk-reward trade-off operating on a free market. So instead of having all these segregated blockchains, each of which need their own trust network, their own capital cost, fragmenting trust across the ecosystem, you can recapture them back into the Ethereum ecosystem, where anybody can now innovate at the level of building new consensus protocols, at the level of building new virtual machines, at the level of building new dApps. It's open innovation all through the stack, permissionless competition. Instead of one, one protocol to rule them all one trust network to rule them all. OK, so that's the core idea. Let me see how we are doing on time here. I mean, it would be lunch, but I think uh, OK, uh, let me take another piece, yeah. you know, few minutes to wrap this up. OK, so the idea here um, is reminiscent of merge mining. For the many of you who are around in this area for a long time. So you know in proof-of-work systems, the dominant cost is not validation cost, it's mining cost. And that's obvious because, of course, mining takes up all energy and cost. So merge mining was a mechanism by which you amortize mining cost into many, many systems. You can build many blockchains which share the same mining and thereby amortize mining costs. However, the reason merge mining was not very successful is that the crypto economics does not transfer from the main chain, say Bitcoin, to any other merge mine chain. What do I mean by the crypto economics does not transfer? Even if 100% of all the miners opt in to your additional chain. The problem is, if you attack the additional chain, the merge mined chain, you do not lose your Bitcoin. Most definitely, you do not lose your Bitcoin mining equipment. And Bitcoin does not crash in value because it has nothing to do with this new alt chain. Merge mining, therefore, has had a very bad rep. However, merge staking, which we define this idea called restaking, is completely different. It's similar in its basic idea that the dominant cost in a proof of stake system is not validation cost. It is the cost of capital. It is the cost of locking up a large amount of money for a certain amount of time. Merge staking is the amortization of the cost of capital. The same cost of capital can now be used to serve many, many different chains, many applications. The, the main difference, though, with merge mining, the, similar, the, merge, the main difference is the crypto economics transfer perfectly. What do I mean by that? If you had $100 billion in each state, and maybe only even $10 billion restate in Eigenlayer, and you did something bad in Eigenlayer, you will get your $10 billion of ETH slashed, not some new Eigen token. So the crypto economics transfers perfectly. Merge staking is fundamentally different from merge mining because it has perfect crypto economic transfer. We know proof of stake is different because you have slashing. But because you have slashing, it enables this extremely powerful, extremely powerful interface of crypto economic transfer on which you can build many, many services. Okay. So I'm going to pass through some of these things. So we've built, you can build any middleware on top of Eigenlayer. We built the first middleware, which is a data availability layer, which can be secured by each stakers. We built on all the pioneering innovation here in the Ethereum community, 
which is how do you use uh, data availability sampling, how do you use polynomial commitments, multi-reveal, donk sharding. We can actually get it working as a restaked layer on Ethereum today. So I'll skip through this, and I'll just point out two major advantages of Eigenlayer before we wrap up. Eigenlayer leverages staker heterogeneity. What do I mean by that? Uh, today, all, as, as users of you know, these ecosystems, one of the things we know is the most valuable commodity in blockchains is block space. Most valuable commodity. How is block space priced? Block space, block space is priced or based on how close you are to the block limit. That's EAP 1559. So question is, if you're close, how is this block limit determined? Block limit is determined based on the resources available on the least powerful staker that you want to accommodate. You want to accommodate the home validator in Venezuela having a one megabyte per second connection, which is an amazing decentralization goal. But there are other stakers who have more resources. And they cannot bring that to bear fruitfully inside the Ethereum ecosystem, so they stake in some other like ecosystem parallelly. Instead, you have a massive staker heterogeneity, and Eigenlayer lets you exploit the staker heterogeneity. You can build layers which have somewhat smaller crypto economic security, but have very large boosts in performance on top of the same ecosystem. OK, I'll skip through this. And finally, I just want to point out a major advantage for governance of protocols like Ethereum. So there is a massive trade-off in protocol governance between democrat democratic governance and the agility of response. You can be extremely democratic, but democracy means you are taking the opinions of all kinds of stakeholders into account, which is needed leads to long-term stability, but does not lead to short-term agility, the ability to respond to changes in technology, the changes in demands. So protocols today have to make a trade-off between agility, the ability to respond fast, and having democratic governance. Ethereum plus Eigenlayer solves this trade-off completely. Why? You have a credibly neutral layer, Ethereum, which is also democratically governed. So it's very, very stable on the core layer, consensus, and basic execution. On top of it, on Eigenlayer, everybody competes fairly in an open market to provide any other services. So you, have, you can leverage the same trust network to create agile innovation, as well as have a layer of stability that people who want long-term stability can use. So I'll, I'll stop with this and point out that Eigenlayer enables a new era of open innovation, which really was pioneered by Ethereum, because you can build all kinds of interesting things on top of Eigenlayer. You can build new side chains, which are extremely powerful. You can build new bridges. You can build keepers, event-driven systems. You can build ordering layers which do anti-MEV solutions, all kinds of things, modules that can be built on top of the common trust network. Thank you.